No one knows the day or the hour yes. but my father only. Yes. So there's no point in trying to No, and I I have a frustration out. with that a little yeah. bit because yeah. there are so many out there that they will they will make complex charts and almost right. try and pinpoint and sometimes yeah. try and pinpoint the exact coming of Christ. And I feel like that flies in the face of Jesus yeah. himself saying yeah. that. So it's like this balance almost that we need to strike about being aware of the times, yeah. but also not getting distracted by thinking we could figure out the exact day. Hey guys, and welcome to the True North Podcast. My name is Chris Quiring, as always your host, and we have a very special guest with us today, Mr. John Tweedy. John is the host of The Prophetic Connection. It is a television ministry about the nation of Israel that is seen around the world in over 250 countries. He has done more than 20 seasons talking about the truth in the scriptures and how it relates to the nation of Israel. And we are so very grateful to have him on the podcast with us today. John has been a pastor. John has been an electrician as well. He has yeah. had a wide variety of experience, but God has used him in an incredible way over the last years to talk about how incredibly important the nation of Israel is in the prophetic timeline and in the future of the church. So we are so glad to have you here with us, John. Thank you for coming to join us. Pleasure. I was just kind of coming up in our conversation. Did you ever think you would be a televangelist? Was that ever on your list of things to do? Uh, never in a million years. I was called to be a pastor. I always saw myself as a pastor. But somewhere along the way, we'll call it the sideline developed into what it's become today. For 18 years, I continued serving as a pastor, preaching most Sundays, visiting the sick and so forth. The other half of my life was developing programs for television. Mm. So it, it began in a small way. All these years later, it is, as you just mentioned, it's the show seen around the world. It's pretty remarkable to think that your face is on people's little screens all the way around the world yeah. on a given day. Daily, because I mean, we're on multiple networks. It's an amazing story. And it's really the story of what God can do if you're willing mm. and if you're obedient. Mm. And that's not to say that I'm in any sense perfect, but it is to say that I, st I strive to serve his kingdom as well as I can. Go through the doors that he opens and he continues... Yeah. In fact, just overnight, I, I heard from our agent of another cable television possibility uh, that we're going to pursue. Wow. And we've been on Christian television for oh, the last number of years. More recently, we've gone on to what's called family-friendly television, sure. where they're, it's not overtly Christian, but the people want quality family programming. So we've begun to air on these these networks as well. So. We're venturing beyond Christian television because we're all about the message of Christ mm. and reaching the nations. And our mandate is in Matthew 24, verse 14, where Jesus said, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world mm. as a witness to all nations, and then the end will come. Mm. So we see within this, our goal is, because God has opened up the television avenues yeah. is to take every opportunity to present his truth. The world desperately needs the truth, Amen. the Christian gospel. And he's given you such a unique avenue to preach the gospel because you have a passion for Israel, specifically right. the nation of Israel, both right. in the Old Testament and the modern day nation state yeah. of Israel. And he's given you an extreme passion to a hunger to learn about it and then a passion to share that experience and that knowledge you've gained. What I find in today's day and age is your average person has virtually no understanding, no real understanding about who Israel is, neither was nor is, or how it fits into the prophetic and the biblical timeline. So for all of those out there who have no working knowledge whatsoever on this issue, let's say you were in an elevator with somebody and they asked you, why is Israel important? And you just had a minute or two to tell them, what would you say to encapsulate that? Why should we care about the nation of Israel? Well, I would say probably, first of all, have you heard of Jesus? <laughs> uh, most people have. And then I might say, have you, do you realize Jesus was Jewish? Hmm. And then why was he Jewish? Or why is he Jewish? And then I would tell the story that um, God, there are prim two primary themes in the Bible. The one is that God raised up a nation, Israel, for his own purposes. In other words, most nations have evolved through wars and treaties and whatever. 
But nation was uniquely brought into being through the choosing of Abram, mm -hmm. who became Abraham, the first Jew or the first Hebrew. Uh, so that's, that's the one theme, this special nation. But why this special nation? Because God desired that through that nation, he would give the world a savior who would save the world from sin, mm -hmm. sinfulness. And of course, that was the person of Jesus of Nazareth. Mm -hmm. And so all roads, past, present, and future prophetic roads, lead to Israel and mm -hmm. lead to Jerusalem because the Bible says that's where the where human history, the culmination of human history will occur. That the same Jesus who came once and died on the cross for the sins of the world, that's for you, me, and everyone else, mm -hmm. if we believe in him and if we appropriate to ourselves his sacrifice in our place as a lamb sacrificed for sin in the tradition of, of Israel. Uh, but he's coming again, mm. and he's coming again as the defender of Israel. You know, it's interesting. Why is this tiny little nation yeah. at the eastern end of the Mediterranean, which is really a strip of land, half of it is desert, why is it always front page news? Yeah. Why are so many people against it? What has it done that has invited all this anger, wrath, and threats of annihilation? Yeah. Well, when you ask the question, the answers are found within the Bible, mm. that this is a unique nation. In fact, in Deuteronomy chapter 7, in the Old Testament, God asked the, the rhetorical question, really, why is Israel special? And he said, they're not special because they're more in number than any other nation. In and of themselves. In number, yeah. Simply because I love Israel. Yeah. So then I say as a Christian, well, if God loves Israel, I should love Israel. Mm. Well, how, how do I demonstrate my love to Israel when in our case as a ministry, it's through charitable works where we're feeding thousands, you know, literally thousands of children, we're feeding them every day. Mm. Some of them would be going to school without a meal or they'd be going to bed hungry. We're supporting 10 charities in Israel mm. that take care of children, older people who can't afford food, Holocaust survivors who are mm. diminishing in number day by day mm. because most of them now are well up into their 80s and 90s. Special children, and I have a heart. I have a heart for children and I have a heart for special children. So we're providing food, nutritious diets for special children who can't be fed orally through the mouth yeah. but are fed through tubes in their abdomen. All of that sort of thing, that's what we do. So we've really. So you're serving both by material, physical yeah. needs yeah. and then by awareness too, right? Yeah. We're serving whomever. Arab people, we don't distinguish. We, we support the charities and let them uh, deal with the practical needs of the people. That's really When cool. I go to Israel, I get to meet these children and these yeah. people, and I see them getting fed, and it's, it's, it's very satisfying. So our primary focus really is to raise awareness especially in the Christian church, about Israel's place. Because in the church, I find people are very focused on spreading the good news of the, the message of Jesus. Sure. But they don't realize where Israel fits in, in that God's continuum. plans and purposes. Well, and they sometimes don't seem to be fully aware of the context. So many of Jesus' parables only make sense in the context of a Jewish worldview. Right. So many of his references are hyperlinks back to a previous Old Testament story. Stories about Jesus as a rabbi walking around wearing a prayer shawl. To us, that's immaterial, but it's integral to the text to understand Jesus and where we came from. So well, you can't understand the New Testament without the roots of the Jewish Old Testament. Exactly. Jesus is first and foremost a Jew, and he kept the traditions of Israel mm. as long as he was on earth. And, that's, and, and to understand who he is, we have to understand his people the nation of Israel. Sure. And he's coming back for Israel. He's coming back to Israel. I sometimes joke in churches and say, he's not coming to Toronto, Montreal, or right. New York. The Bible tells us he's returning specifically to the Montreal. Like there's a geographic location. This isn't an assumption. There's a geographic location yes. to the location of the temple, right? Of course. Yeah. I've stood, and I'm sure you have too, on the Mount of Olives and overlooked the Kidron Valley as it leads back up to the Temple Mount. Right. And it's it's a sobering thought to think that Jesus will one day walk these steps again. Yeah. yeah, I also have a theory, and we won't take the time, but I believe that he was probably crucified on the Mount of Olives. 
Oh, interesting. And he was actually facing the temple. As it happened. Uh, when he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken huh. me? Now, I know there are other traditions of where the, the garden crucifixion tomb. took place yeah. and where he was buried. I have a sense that it could have well have been the Mount of Olives, the very place that he's returning to, right. according to the prophecies. And where he cried out and sweat blood before yes. the crucifixion in the Gethsemane Garden. Yeah. So you've already alluded to this, and let's dive in, because I think that the question people are asking these days, almost more than any when it comes to this issue, is are we in the end times now? Yeah. Uh, you know, in this eschatological, in the end times timeline, like, are we in this final phase? If someone was to come to you and ask you that question, John, are we in the end times? What would you say? Well, I would refer them to uh, Matthew 24 and the parallel account in uh, Luke's gospel in 21. And really, Jesus responds to the questions his disciples asked because they were from, most of them were from Galilee in the rural area. So when they got to Jerusalem and saw the structures, but especially the temple that Herod, King Herod had been refurbishing for mm. years, it was a, I mean, it was a wonder of the ancient world with its yeah. colonnades and it was, it's, it was the center of Judaism on the Temple Mount. And so Jesus, the disciples pointed it out to Jesus as if they needed to do that, but they were really just saying, isn't, isn't this a marvelous man-made structure? Yeah. And he said to them, they must have been stunned, shocked when he said, well, let me tell you something. Not one of these stones will be left standing upon mm. another that will not be cast down. Mm. Well, that got their attention. And so we read uh, that later that day, they came, actually specifically four of them came, Peter and Andrew, James and John, the two sets of brothers. And their names are listed in, in Mark's gospel in chapter 13. But anyway... Those four come to him later that day, intrigued by what he said. Mm -hmm. And then they say to him, tell us, when will these things be? What will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Right. So they're asking the question that you just raised. Are we in the end times? How close are we to Armageddon and the second coming of Christ? Mm -hmm. Well, then he launches into this discourse. And more than once, in fact, I think it's three times he mentions there will be an age of deception. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the hallmarks of the times. But then he goes into more practical things like there will be wars and rumors of wars. Mm -hmm. There'll be famines, pestilences, earthquakes in diverse places, as if to say in places you wouldn't expect earthquakes. So I know from the, um, the United States, the Geological Survey, that earthquake activity has been increasing. Mm. There are hundreds, if not thousands, of earthquakes every day. They just don't measure on the Richter scale. Famines, we can see with our own eyes. Mm. We can see the changing weather, weather patterns because Mark includes the reference in what Jesus said, the seas and the waves roaring, mm. which for me is unusual weather patterns, storms happening where they would not normally happen, extreme climate changes. So people talk about climate change. Well, Jesus told us it was coming nearly 2,000 years hmm. ago. So he gave all these signs, but then he said something else. He said, all these, all these signs are the beginning of birth pains, uh, yeah. equating it with a, a woman in labor, that as the pains increase, then the intensity of the pains increase. So it's as if to say, these will be more frequent, they, they will, uh, right. events will accelerate, but you will see intense things occurring. Mm. So in other words, major hurricanes, pestilence as well, that would, COVID would fall under that category for me, SARS, AIDS, things that are, have been more common to the 20th and 21st centuries. In addition to all of that, Israel has been reborn yeah, in 1948. Yeah, that's fascinating. So now celebrating her 75th anniversary. Yeah. And among the other things he said is, this generation that sees these signs, uh, will, they'll all be fulfilled uh, before this generation passes away. Mm -hmm. Which raises the question, how long is a generation? Right. And when does that generational clock start ticking? But I do believe that we are seeing, we're seeing in our own real time, the signs that Jesus gave manifested on the earth today. So if you were one of the disciples who had transported here now, let's say we had a checklist of all of those things that you were just talking about, you would say without a doubt that we're nearing very close to the end of that list, completing so many of those yeah. things in our culture, in the world at large around us. 
most of the prophecies have been fulfilled, I believe something like 90% uh, in sort of approximate numbers. There are a couple of things that still have to happen, um, such as the appearance of the Antichrist figure mm -hmm. before Christ comes to fight him at the Battle of Armageddon. Mm -hmm. I believe personally that he's probably in the world today waiting mm -hmm. in the wings for his cue to come onto center stage. The Antichrist you're talking about. The Antichrist about. figure and the system, what's called the, his system or the beast system of mm -hmm. Revelation 13. People will be marginalized and won't be able to buy or sell mm -hmm. unless they have the number. There's or, some fascinating yeah. so, prophecy in Revelation. So about that. when I see all the signs happening, I was seeing... The Apostle Paul writing to the church of Thessalonica in what was Macedonia, northern Greece, said, because there were rumors that Christ had come. Right. So you can imagine 2,000 years ago, news traveled by ship, horseback. It took a while. Yeah. So something happening in Israel would take a while to reach northern Greece. But they were hearing rumors, and it may be that some of the rumors were deliberately spawned. But anyway, Paul is forced to write a second letter to them and say to them, Christ has not come. But let me be clear, here's what needs to happen before Christ comes. Mm -hmm. So if, until these things happen, uh, you can believe Christ has not come. Two things. One was a falling away from the true faith and then the appearance of the lawless one, otherwise known as the Antichrist. Mm -hmm. Two very clear prophetic markers. Well, we're seeing in the Christian church the falling away. Since Sadly. the 1960s, uh, the denial of miracles, the denial of the virgin, all the major doctrines that stood for 2,000 years, mm. like nine pins, have been knocked over in the mainline churches. So Fair we've enough. had this great falling away from the faith. We have churches, um, for example, in the British Isles, churches being turned into mosques because of the population shift. And so I've seen it locally. So even. in the Western world, Christianity seems to be losing ground. But in the third world, it's gaining Gaining's ground. Soon. So you have this dichotomy going on. And then the other thing Paul said was you'll have that, but then you will have the appearance of this lawless, the man of lawlessness. Now, take a look at the world in which we live. Mm. The streets have become lawless. Mm. Uh, people can rob stores in America with impunity. So I was in San Francisco for a week. This was yes. only three months yeah. ago. And they, they have a major homeless problem. It's yeah. like I haven't seen before. You have to be Terrible. very careful where you go. Yeah. But I found out there's a law over there that you can steal anything up to $1,000. And there is no legal penalty for that whatsoever. Yeah. So entire stores were closing down because people would walk in with shopping carts, fill it up with $950 worth of goods, right. and then walk out. So... There certainly is an element of lawlessness that seems to even be creeping into North American society. It's, 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 it's everywhere in the major cities. Um, you know, it's just, and I was in San Francisco a few years ago myself, and it is the city by the bay, and it's gorgeous. It's beautiful. Gorgeous setting. I mean, but major chains, and I just heard recently uh, that a major mall in, in San Francisco is closing. Mm -hmm. So you're right, the chain stores, the mom and pop stores, because people and, and well, and the crime and the drug scene and all of that. So take a look at the world. Mm. Um, Paris has been burning. So we're seeing lawlessness on a grand scale. And that is, in fact, one Jesus, of the signs. Jesus said, lawlessness, that's one of the markers of the signs of the times. In those first eight verses of Matthew 24, he said, lawlessness shall abound and the love of many shall grow cold. Grow cold. Yeah. And the love of many, the word that's used in the Greek is agape, which is that highest form of love. Mm. And it seems to be saying that even those who have faith, will, their faith will begin to fade as all this takes place. Where it becomes harder to be a Christian in a lawless society. Absolutely. And we can see that now. The headwinds for faithfulness to Jesus are oh. ever increasing at this point in time. So what's an average follower of Jesus to do as they look at the scriptures and the prophecies? What's Jesus's message to us about these signs? Is it to simply be watchful and aware that he is controlling what's happening and not to worry? Is it a message of encouragement? Is it a message of confirmation that Jesus knew this was coming and he wants you to know that none of this is a surprise? 
What do you think our takeaway from noticing these signs is today? There should be some sort of like edifying takeaway for us. What, what should we take away from this that makes a difference in our spiritual life? I think we need to understand where Israel fits in the plan of God. Mm-hmm. Um, our roadmap for all of this, it, it, you realize that um, so much of the Bible is prophetic. Yeah. Well, why is that? Well, God spoke to the prophet Amos and said to him in so many words um, that he needs to tell his prophets what's coming so his people will be informed. Mm. So we have a roadmap. I know what the future looks like. Mm. I may not know in precise detail, but I know that Christ is returning as the defender of Israel, as the judge of the whole earth. I know that there will be a clash of good and evil in the Valley of Armageddon, which... I've been there in northern Israel. I filmed there so many times. My current series that is now being edited and will be on air at the end of September, early October is Countdown to Armageddon, Mm. which is the same as saying your earlier question. I do believe we're in the countdown phase leading to Armageddon. And then I'm doing a follow up series called As It Was in the Days of Noah. Once again, picking up on something Jesus said that's recorded in Matthew 24. He said this, and we need to be very clear about this. He said, no one knows the day or the hour but my father only. Yes. So there's no point in trying to... No, and I I have a frustration with that a little bit because there are so many out there that they will will make complex charts and almost try and pinpoint and sometimes try and pinpoint the exact coming of Christ. And I feel like that flies in the face of Jesus himself saying that. So it's like this balance almost that we need to strike about being aware of the times, but also not getting distracted by thinking we could figure out the exact date. Let me give you a great verse. came across it recently. It really hit me. Uh, Deuteronomy 29, verse 29, where it says, The secret things belong to God, Mm. but the revealed things belong to us that we may do them. So... Mm. Secret things, okay? Well, Jesus says, no one knows the day or the hour, but my Father only. That's a secret thing that God reserves for himself. Yeah. So when we keep trying to figure it out by date setting and trying to figure out the Feast of Israel and the right. Spring Feast. So Four blood moons. that belongs to God because Jesus is saying, there's no point in you trying to figure it out. Oh, the rapture, the timing when yeah. we'll all be caught up uh, and taken out of the this world. And once again, is it before the tribulation? Anyway. That was a very that verse released me from mm. a lot of that stuff. Yeah. But the second thing is, but the reveal things belong to us that we may do them. Uh, so when God reveals through prophecy what he intends to do, then what's my role in that? Right. Now, in my case, my role very succinctly, my role is because of the television opportunities to get our programs into as many nations as possible yeah. now up to now we've only been in english that's changing we're currently building a new facility where our ministry has been the same building for 20 years we've outgrown it so we had this opportunity to buy this building with a site plan it was already approved by the city if we stayed with the perimeter walls the city would would approve it we can do what we want with the interior well at first glance it was too big for us but as recently as last week we have hired a new executive director who either speaks or writes in eight different languages. Wow. Now, I won't say more than this. He uh, has been, he's done 3,000 hours of programming in Farsi, the language of Iran, mm. and Arabic, the, lang- the other main language of the Middle East. So because of hiring this person and the experience he brings, which I see as the leading of the Holy Spirit, mm. we've reconfigured the interior We were going to have a room very much like this to do podcasting, but now we are building a full scale television Mm. studio that will be because we won't have to move the equipment around and have lights in place and all the rest of it. So we can begin to take what will be 21 series of of our show into other languages, but produce new programming with Arabic or Farsi speaking pastors. So this is a new development for Mm. us. And even as we're building this, we're seeing a bigger vision than we've had up to now. That's very so cool. I had no idea, but I. But it's just interesting how God moves in, and why so, He's put us on television. Yeah. I have friends in Africa who tease me and say, "John, we're watching you in the jungle." Um, <laughs> but I do. the The show goes into Africa, and I've been to Africa to preach, uh, and spoken to five thousand people in one place about Israel. Mm-hmm. 
pastors walking through the wilderness to hear the message of Israel. Mm. Uh, 35,000 people marching in a, a western Ugandan city with a military bl- a band at the front and armed escort actually for protection. 35,000 people coursing through the city with television cameras catching it and with drones in the air, all marching in support of Israel. Hmm. In the heart of Africa. That's amazing. And they want me back. They keep, they tried to get me back last year and the year before. And my board recently approved, uh, John, go to Africa when you're ready. Hmm. Uh, we'll approve you going back because they're hungry for the Word of God. And we actually produce our, our, our newspaper that's a bi-monthly for uh, Canada. We produce it for America. I've seen it. And we send the American version to Uganda, and they put their own information in there. So it's astonishing. That's, you never would have dreamed that as you began this. Gee, on my what? That's very cool. I just want to pull back for a second. You said something profound there, is that... That the purpose of prophecy must eventually lead to some kind of obedience. Yeah. It's not just for information's sake. Is that You mentioned that in some way this is going to translate. And that's essentially in Revelation, John 21. He talks about that. Yeah. The goal of this book is that you might keep the prophecy, yeah. not just know. And so I think that that's such a beautiful way of summing up how important it is to see the signs, to yeah. recognize what era we are in, in the timeline of Jesus' second coming. But not just to stop there, to let that spur you on to passion and obedience, to know that we're in the last days, that that might make you more faithful yeah. as things get more difficult. The book of Revelation where the risen Christ appeared to the Apostle John on the island of Patmos in the Aegean Sea. I've actually, I was there recently. In Revelation chapter 10, a mighty angel comes down with a little book in his hand. It's a mighty angel with a very small book mm. and says to John, eat this. And so John eats it, and when he tastes it, it's sweet, but it becomes bitter when when he swallows it in his stomach. Mm. And the message seems to be, this is the word of God. It's it's sweet, uh, but then but it's the prophetic word of God. And then it it in within that chapter ten of Revelation, John is told that he's God's going to put him before kings and significant people. That the prophecies must be proclaimed. Yeah. So that's his mandate. Yep. And of course, the whole book of Revelation is the future written in advance. And remember, it's, it was what the, the risen Christ revealed to John. Right. Why? And he said to him, write what you see and hear. Hmm. Well, that obviously is for the benefit of generations. Yeah, this wasn't just for John born. by any means. And so that's where the roadmap takes us from here. Hmm the unfolding judgments of God, the seven seals, uh, the seven trumpet judgments, the seven bowl judgments. And when you read about the devastation that they cause and you see what's happening to the planet today, you could believe we're almost on the edge of those. Mm. But we haven't seen anything yet because what God is going to do through those judgments, the world is going to be under judgment. Mm. And so it's God's payback time for all the evil Mm. that, that has been perpetrated. So you have a fascinating story of how you wound up with Christians for Israel. Uh, a friend of mine who's on the board was telling you, me about it, and it had to do with somebody calling you out, kind of identifying you in a room. This, this really wasn't even on your radar, was it, to be in this type of ministry? Or could you tell us that story? Because it sounded like kind of a miraculous way that you were appointed to this particular role. When I became a Christian uh, at the age of 27, I, I just had a voracious appetite for reading the Word of God. But I, I was captivated by the story of Israel and the prophecies. And now when I look back, that could not have happened other than God gave me that revelation and put mm-hmm. that hunger. And so very and so even as a student minister, when I was still in university and then seminary, uh, and then I was going out to speak in churches and I was really a rookie, I was always drawn to the prophetic passages. So mm-hmm. I was speaking from... Uh, the prophecies a lot of the time, but always talking about Israel is a very special nation and we need to see them within God's plans and purposes because at the very heart of everything that the Bible teaches and Jesus, of course. um, So I gained a reputation for being a pro-Israel pastor. Christians for Israel International had already established a branch in America and other branches. They were expanding. 
Uh, they began in Holland and they were expanding around the world. They decided they would try to establish a branch in Canada. So their American executive director came into Ontario and just started in, engaging pastors and asking questions. Well, it led, he, they led him to me. They said, John is pro, pro-Israel pastor. So he came, I invited him to come back and preach. And he came with his family. And then he said, we're thinking of setting up a board of directors. Would you be interested in serving on the board? I said, well, I'm always interested in things Israel, but I won't make a commitment, but I'm interested. So in September of that year, which was 1997, uh, a meeting was convened at the um, Crossroads Communications, Huntley Street Studios Mm -hmm. in the boardroom. And it was convened by a Dutchman who was the vice president of the organization. So I was invited to the meeting and we just finished building our new church and I was kind of exhausted Mm. uh, physically, mentally, and whatever. So I went to this, I was invited, and I went to the meeting. And um, I I remember in the car before I entered the building, I said, Lord, this is all about Israel. I'm not volunteering. If I'm to be involved, you know me, I'm in with both feet, Mm. 150%. So I went to the meeting, and there were like 50 people. It was standing room only. So I had a seat, a very long boardroom table, probably maybe eight to 10 on one side and the other side, the ends and standing room around because there were about 50 people in the room. And across the table were the principals from Europe that had come over to get this branch started. And the meeting went on and there was discussion and so forth. In the middle of this meeting, the man that was chairing the meeting leaned forward. He looked down the end to where I was sitting. I wasn't even in his line of sight. He had to lean forward to see me. And he said this, this is as true as it, this is what happened. He said, the man at the end, I don't know who he is. We've not been introduced, but the Holy Spirit just spoke to me in my thoughts and said, this man will help to get this ministry established in Canada. Wow. Well, he and I left that meeting. He knew a Christian lawyer. We sought articles of incorporation uh, in Ontario. And then the principals came over from Holland again, because now that it was time to establish the officers of the corporation. So they said, and rightfully so, they said of this man, okay, Sid, you will be the chairman because Sid was a very successful businessman in the trucking industry anyway. Uh, and then John, John will be the vice chairman. And Sid said, no. He said, John will be the chairman and I will be the vice chairman. Wow. Well, that was, we started. And in a small way and just... Uh, began to develop well it wasn't long before um, I was being invited to become a vice president of international Mm -hmm. chairman of Canada vice president of international which means I'd be going back to Holland for meetings so I said well uh, and and in fact I think they probably wanted thought I would should relocate I said well I'm not God has released me from my church but if my church will share me I will take this role on in this and so Well, I did that, and the next thing, I'm chairman of International. I became chairman of the global organization movement. We've since separated, but that's a whole other story. It had to do with trademark control and and where the the control would lie. And so... But that moment where you were like identified, picked out of a room, that must have been a shock. That must have been... You've heard the expression, I almost fell out of my chair. Yeah. I was stunned. (laughs) Because I had prayed and I had deliberately, well, there was no opportunity for me to say much anyway, because there were, there were, in my view, very important people in the room. And the the discussion was at a much higher level than I'm just a pastor of the local church. Mm. But I had prayed that prayer. Right. And I'd said, Lord, if there's a role for me somewhere here, you need to show me. So it's, I know for beyond a shot of a doubt. Yeah. Well, when he said that, and then I realized this this man, and I'm not given to all these, you know, like God talks to us all the time, but that was a moment. And I learned that this man, uh, he did have, he was sensitive to the spirit because he mm. said other things years later that um, were also from the Lord. And um, I, I saw in practice that he did hear from God. Yeah, and, and I he, believe that too. Yeah, he wasn't given to fanciful thoughts because no. you, you can measure it after the fact when you yeah. see the fruit which w- you test it that came from it that's right so i've seen the fruit of his thoughts 
and promptings, I'll call them, of the Holy Spirit. You've seen the fruit in the ministry too, the I've way that it expanded and stuff like that. And you like know that. what? He invested, because he was a wealthy Christian businessman, he invested in many different ministries. He was mm -hmm. just a great supporter of Christ I love those Christian guys. school systems and so forth. Yeah. But he really rejoiced in C4I, Christians for Israel, yeah. because he could see. And he said to me one day, he said, you know, John, and he gave us a significant uh, help to get, get us up and running. And, he's, and he, uh, he said, you know, if you ever, if, you, if there's a need, come and see me. Mm. And I said to him, if I need to come to you for more money, I haven't done the job. Mm. Or God hasn't blessed us the way I think he will. And I never had to go back to him and oh, say, that's we, cool. we have a need. So he rejoiced because he saw, he just rejoiced in the expansion. Yeah, um, it's, a beaut it's a remarkable thing. It, it's, it's, it's nothing short of the hand of God to the glory of God. So there's two interesting thoughts that I had just as we were preparing for this interview. And one of them is, I would love to talk just shortly about the miracle of modern day Israel. So we need to divide a little bit for our understanding, or maybe you can correct me on this, but there is the Old Testament Jewish people, right? The nation of Israel. Yeah. It was a theocracy where God was their God. And then they had a monarch over top, but the Old Testament nation of Israel, people may not realize that they did not dwell in the promised land continuously from then until now. The right. new current modern nation state of Israel is a relatively new phenomenon. You said 75 years mm -hmm. this year. Yeah. So what ended up happening was, is that they recongregated back in the nation of Israel and were able to form amidst immense pressure. And how many wars have happened over that period of 19, was it 1940? Oh, six, I can't remember. And then all the way kind of through there, there was the Six Days War of 1960. Yeah. 19, 1947, 48, the War of Independence, yeah. um, fighting to be established as a nation. A vote of the United Nations in November of 1947 that Israel should be reestablished as a nation. At one point, they thought it might be reestablished in Uganda. Wrong oh, location. Right. But anyway, that was part of the, the, the way discussion. back in the, yeah. Uh, in the late 19th century. But in any case, um, then 1956, the Suez War, 1967, the Six-Day War in June of that year, 1973, the Yom Kippur War, when they were attacked on their most holy day of the year, uh, 82, the Lebanese War. And the miracle of it all. Yeah. And always coming through. And, and I used to have a guide in Israel who would explain things this way, and he would say, but for the finger of God. Right. Unusual things where you read stories of they were in a minefield and suddenly the wind picked up hmm. and blew all the topsoil off and the mines were exposed. Hmm. Th things like that that in the natural realm, you know. Yeah. Should, so there's all kinds of stories. But here's the thing. Uh, in Jeremiah chapter 31, God makes a new covenant with the house of Israel. We know that as the covenant that Jesus instituted at the Last Supper. But if you read on in that chapter, there's God's guarantee of Israel's survival. Mm. As long as the sun shines by day, the moon and the stars by night, Israel shall remain. Mm. So is the sun shining? <laughs> Do the stars shine by night? So that's God's guarantee of Israel's survival mm. because he has an appointment uh, in the Valley of Armageddon and there will be more conflict for sure, mm. but all roads, prophetic roads, lead to this culmination in the Valley of Armageddon. And I think we speak about the Battle of Armageddon, but it's multiple battles, really. It's going to be the battle over Jerusalem. Mm. Uh, they, they, they could be happening, in a sense, simultaneously, but it's all part of that huge end time scenario that we read about in Revelation 19. So would you, how would you explain this to somebody? Is the church the continuation of the nation of Israel or is the church a separate entity from the nation of Israel? Because well, the word, the term people of God is, is almost synonymously used at varying points for both. How would you explain that to somebody? The apostle Paul wrestled. He was a Jew, rabbi, trained rabbi, wrestled with the whole question of Israel. He said, I believe in Jesus. Why don't the rest of my... So through Romans 9, 10, 11, Paul has a discussion in his head. He's going through all these rhetorical questions. Uh, if I, and, and in fact, he, at one point he says, I would willingly give up my salvation if Israel would right. just get the point. But when you get to chapter 11, he asks the rhetorical question, has God abandoned Israel? Right. And he says very clearly, absolutely not. Mm. 
And then he goes on to say uh, they are blinded in part. They're certainly blinded where the identity of the Messiah is concerned. But then he ends up saying God has a plan of redemption for Israel. The Redeemer will come out of Zion and all Israel shall be saved. So Paul the Apostle, who is somewhat of an authority in the New Testament, who wrote 13 letters we can identify. And as far as I'm concerned, he wrote the book of Hebrews or certainly, but, but anyway, that's, the author's not named. But uh, the point is that he lays out God's plan of salvation for Israel. So um, you ask the question, and really the term we use, technical term we use for what you suggested about as a church replaced Israel, we call that replacement theology. Right. Well, Paul knocks that on the head and mm. says, absolutely not. Mm. The church is the church, and Israel is Israel. And God has a plan for Israel Mm. that is unfolding and will be revealed in due course according to Revelation. Which is a huge part of why you have such a passion for Israel, because they're not just a past tense story. There is much yet to happen. Here's the phenomenon. Israel, the temple was destroyed in AD 70 after a Roman siege. The Jews, for the most part, were scattered to the four winds, which is why we have Jews everywhere all over the world. But ironically, they're coming back. Yep. Uh, they have been coming back. They're still coming back. Um, and then in the AD uh, 135, uh, the Roman emperor, um, Hadrian, there was another dispersion. So, if, But if you measure it from AD 70 until the rebirth of Israel in 1948, that's 1,870 years. So for 1,870 years, Israel didn't exist. Right. Now, there was always a Jewish remnant in the land, not, not everybody was dispersed, though there were always Jews in the land. But imagine that in 1947, the United Nations voted, they mm-hmm. cast votes, and they voted for the reestablishment of a Jewish homeland 1,870 years this later. This has never happened. No it's nation has ever been and the only reestablished way you can exp- like The only that. way you can explain it is the prophecy said, mm-hmm. and all I would have to say is Isaiah 43, for example, that Israel will be regathered from the nations. That's, and I mean, regardless of what someone may think about the Christian views on prophecy and about the end times, that is a miracle that has no real human explanation about the reestablishment. Yeah, I say I I was writing in the seventh, eighth century uh, before Christ, 27, 2800 years ago, he said, Israel will be reestablished. Can you imagine the Jews during the Holocaust in Europe, dying, suffering in the death camps, knowing these prophecies and thinking, what's this? It's never going to happen. Mm. And in 1948, three years after his, Hitler's demise, mm. the star of David is fluttering in the wind over Israel. Yeah. Within three years of the end of the Second World War. That's that's you amazing. You can only explain it by the hand of God. That's why the prophecies are so important, mm. because no one has ever disproved a prophecy that's in the Bible. Mm. And even the archaeological discoveries of today they keep affirming that King David was a real person yep. uh, and so forth and so on. Every archaeological discovery affirms what the Bible has already said. Yeah, which increases our trust in what it says about the future. Even the Dead Sea Scrolls discovery was amazing. And amazing. They were discovered in 1947, uh, just before the rebirth of modern Israel. For mm. all those years, they were in the caves. Mm. And I'm often filming in front of those caves. It's beautiful. Um, and that showed us that the word of God had not changed through all the translations. Which is another miracle. For the most part. And then, you know, uh, the books of Daniel, um, that prophecy of Isaiah, of the regathering, uh, all all there, all there. So let me ask you just in summation, you've been to Israel how many times now? Do you have a little... uh... Let's Mark just on your bed post. Counting at a hundred. Are you? You've been over a hundred times. Oh, probably closer to two. I'm. I'm in Israel three to four times a year. Wow. Minimum. So let me ask you this: If you could only go to one place again in Israel, your favorite spot in the entire nation of Israel, if you could only go to one and spend the day there, where would you go? I can't answer the question because, um, I mean, they're all special. I. Let me put it this way. When I'm in the Holy Land, I'm home. Mm. Uh, you know, I could joke and say the immigration people said to me, Hi, John, where have you been? <laughs> <laughs> We've missed you. <laughs> people here meet my wife in the store um, and they'll say, uh, 
when's John coming home? Because hmm. there's the impression. Because when people see me, I'm always in Israel. Sure. So the impression is I'm living That's in where Israel. No, I don't. I live here and I go there two or three times a year. I certainly go twice to film in the spring and the fall. But I, I honestly can't say, because everywhere to me is special. When I'm there and walking in the prophecies, um, I could easily say, well, when I'm in Jerusalem, because it's the holy city. Yeah. But when I'm on the Sea of Galilee. And, I agree with that. Yeah. I, I, I've been on the Sea of Galilee with 90, more or less 95 people, 45 of them from Uganda with drums, beating their drums and dancing and singing Christian songs on a boat on the, the middle of the Galilee. Sea of Galilee. That's cool. And I've had the people, the organizers, uh, also at the baptismal site where they had the drums and they kept me in the water for 45 minutes with either either baptizing them or rededicating them because they've mm. been baptized once. Right. I don't baptize them a second time. Uh, and then with their pastors with me, assisting me in and then the drums playing and singing and i've had the organizers of that baptismal site say to me we have never seen anything like this in all the years mm. that people have been coming here because the joy was just infectious and um they were in the river jordan they were singing god's praise that's beautiful and their african drums in fact they subsequently sold the drums to the people on the boat after we had the uh -huh. boat ride well, they can go back and get more drums, and they made a fortune selling the drums <laughs> to the people on the boat. It was a win-win. <laughs> That's really neat. Well, John, it's been a pleasure having you on. Uh, Christians for Israel is the name of the organization that you represent and that you lead. And the Prophetic Connection, you can go look that up online on YouTube or on Daystar and various other uh, broadcast channels to watch those 20, how many? 20? Well, it's soon to be 21. So 21 we're, we're just seasons. editing season 20. Uh, and a couple of the seasons, uh, Revelation is actually 26 episodes. Okay. So it's it's chapter by chapter. The book of Acts is 28 episodes because I did the entire book. We walked with the apostles through it's the really, book of Acts, which cool. for the first time took us beyond Israel. We did some filming in Greece. Okay. We, we followed Paul in his yeah. his, his, his journey. And Athens. So and... I was in Thessalonica. Um, I was in Athens. I was in ancient Corinth because mm. we always like to film in the biblical setting. And for those who have never been, it's if remarkable to yeah. stand on the ground where Paul stood, to stand, oh, yeah. to stand in the cell that Jesus may have been kept the night before in Caiaphas's Precisely. prison. It's, it's impossible to put into words what it's like to sit yeah. by the Sea of Galilee and know that yeah. the, our Lord and Savior was walking those very steps. One day. And I know our audience love that because if they've been, they're trying to figure out, sometimes it's obvious where I am, other times it's... And then those who have can't, I was all, you know, I'm always aware of the fact so many thousands, perhaps hundreds of thousands of pastors through 2000 years of Christian history who taught the Bible, but had never walked mm -hmm. in the actual yeah. footsteps of Jesus. Uh, then what a, what a privilege it is. So for us to be able to take people there who can't get there yeah. for whatever reason, that pleases me. That Absolutely. If you can't get there, let us here's the valley of armageddon yeah. here's the sea of galilee it was a life-changing experience for me in 2010 when i went we're going back this year in october yeah. cannot wait yeah. thank you john for spending this time with us blessings on you as you continue to preach the gospel and care for the orphans and the widows in the land of israel and we just pray that the next season of ministry you're a part of here will only continue that trajectory of growth thank you so much a pleasure glad to have you